So the bottom line with the K function is it is a summary measure of the characteristics of the process, something that we can easily, quote unquote, estimate from the data. It's basically counting and dividing and an averaging process. But it is related to a theoretical moment of the process, this second order moment of the process, which is the counterpart of a variance and a covariance, but for point pattern processes. And that's very interesting, as we'll see at the end, when it comes to estimating processes. Now, there's several extensions of the K function, and I'll spend just a few moments on two of these. One is an extension to two point patterns, bivariate point patterns. We haven't spoken about this a lot, but one obvious type of application is to move from a pure cross-section to space-time, where the two point patterns that we're comparing are basically the same phenomenon, but at two points in time. Let's say we have our crime pattern, and one of the examples is that, and say we take the Buffalo example, and we cut the time period into pre-95 and post-95, are these two patterns closely related, or are they different, or are they, there's no connection between them at all? Okay, so same kind of questions. Um, other questions, so that's a space-time example. Another example would be, um, say you were interested in crimes and you wanted to know, are crimes similarly, similarly located as um, you know, liquor stores? So you look at the pattern of the liquor stores as a point pattern, and you look at the pattern of the shootings as a point pattern. Is there any connection between these two patterns? Are they the crimes clustered with the liquor stores? So where you have liquor stores, you tend to have more crimes. Or are they staying away from the liquor stores, so they're dispersed, or is it random? And this starts to bring us to the modeling idea. Because we can relate a pattern of interest to patterns of possible explanatory variables that then eventually, we, we won't actually get there in, in this course, but eventually you can bring that in a model for the spatial point process, which you can then estimate uh, using typically fancy simulation techniques, but that, that's the rationale. So then we can come up with a model that says, give me the liquor stores, Give me poverty, give me unemployment rate, give me distance to the bus stop, and I can give you a probability that a crime will happen in this location. That's the ultimate goal. We won't go there. Uh, the bivariate K function um, looks at two point patterns, and it's a straightforward extension of the idea of the first order K function. Instead of counting the average number of events within a given distance from an event of one kind, we count the average number of events of the other kind within a given distance of the event of one kind. So we take, it doesn't matter which one we take as the reference, say we take the liquor stores. For each liquor store, we take a distance h. We count how many shootings there are within that distance, and we average it over all the liquor stores. And that is our bivariate measure. Again, in practice, the WIJ is the edge correction. There are a number of different edge corrections. Same idea. As you average, you want to give lower weight, lower importance to those points where there's a lot of edge effects. So they are not as important as the ones where you have uh, no edge effects. References again, spatial randomness, and um, just to make a long story so sh short, the pH squared also comes back for a bivariate pattern. If there is complete spatial randomness in both patterns, so let's say our shootings are completely spatial random and our liquor stores are completely spatial random, then all these K functions are the same. So whether you take the K function for the liquor stores, the K function for the shootings or the cross K function, liquor store to shooting or shooting to liquor store, they should all be the same. They should all be pi H squared. Okay. So then one way to see 
whether these are random is to take the difference between them, which should be zero, because they should be the same. When you're more interested in the correlation between two patterns, we look at how, same idea, you know, complete spatial randomness, envelopes, where is our cross-k function? Is it in the envelope? Can't reject a null. Is it above? Is it below? What is the alternative? Above is clustering, below is inhibition. Okay. So we find a cross-k function above the envelope, we see liquor stores attract crimes, attract shootings. Or we do it, uh, we find it below, then say sh shootings are away from the li li liquor stores more so than they would be randomly. Or you could take police stations, you know, are shootings clustered around police stations or far away from police stations, and so on. You know. So the idea is you have two patterns, you want to see is there any connection between these two patterns. How do you do this? Through this cross K function. Inference is always the same. This is the example that I mentioned. We take the pre-95 homicides and we take the post-95 homicides. They are red. Um, so you see, you can't do this. And um, you just force it. We'll talk about that in the lab, uh, about how to actually do this. So, you know, are these the same or are they different? Are they uh, very similar? Turns out they're highly correlated. So the patterns basically don't change over time. That's what that means. They are very correlated. This is the randomization envelope. Here is the complete spatial randomness. And you're way above it for these two patterns. So in this case, it's the same phenomenon at two points in time. But you could also take two different phenomena at the same point in time or two phenomena at different points in time. That um, doesn't matter. So this is pretty straightforward. Um, it's a, an extension of the notion of this averaging of the number of events within a given distance from an event to crossing between two paths. That's the first extension that I wanted to talk about. The second extent, and we can actually do that, we'll do this in the lab. The second extension, unfortunately, we can't do. If you're really interested in this, do you have a question? Yeah. I have a question. Okay, go ahead. I don't understand how we figured it out. Okay, that is about the number of H. Is there a consideration of the taking the value of value of H for the same function? Yeah, well, the value of H is like in any estimate. The finer grain you take, the smoother, you, the more detail you will have in the estimate. So in practice, you don't actually take H, you take a range. Okay. So you don't take an exact distance, you can take a range of distances. So you can take, there's a tolerance in, in software, you will see a tolerance as a, as a parameter to see how you want to do this. Conceptually, it's very simple, you just take a distance, and then you draw circles around the points and count how many points there are. Now, what we want to do is approximate this continuous function, which in the limit means we should do it for very small changes in h in the distance. In practice, we don't do that. We make the problem discrete and, and compute this for different intervals. So say we would take it zero to one mile, one mile to two miles, two to three, and then this gives us the point, and then we connect these. And, and the finer grain, this is why you get these jagged edges, you know, you have finer grain intervals. We'll, we'll play with this in the lab, you'll get a sense for it. But uh, as always, you know, this is very general rule. These things, these processes are continuous processes. The models are for continuous the probability is a continuous surface. You know, the things that happen are not continuous. They're discrete, but they're generated by a continuous probability surface. And that's ultimately what we understand, what we want to understand. We want to understand the mechanism that give us these probability surfaces. Because then we can simulate them. And the map that we get is only one realization of a process. So 
if we, you know, you can think of it in the following way, in a policy context, if you want to get a sense, say you really understand what drives crime, and you have a model for it, for the probability that crime occurs at any given location, then you can simulate, you know, weekends of crime, one after another after another. And then you can visualize that and summarize these visualizations using averages or densities or other, other visualization mechanisms. And then show this to people and say, well, this is where it happens. Okay. And, and that is really the power behind it. What you have to remember, and it's, I, I, I realize it's conceptually difficult, is that this one pattern that you observe is just one out of many possible patterns that could have happened with the same underlying mechanism, with the same underlying process. Okay. We saw that in the lab a little bit, you know, when you had the equation for the Poisson cluster process, you had the parameters specified, and nobody had the same map. All these maps were a little bit different. That's the randomness that we can't do anything about. What we're trying to do is understand the processes and how basically flip the reality around from the one map that we got to see, try to figure out what the process is that drives this particular distribution. But this particular distribution is just one of many that could have happened. That's the important thing to keep in mind. That's why simulation is so important in this business because the simulation gives you the power to actually make many different maps. And then you get a better sense. I mean, now you have a homicide on this block, but that doesn't really give you a good sense of where the other homicides might have happened because you don't see those. You only see the ones that actually did happen. And that's one of the things we're trying to do in, in, the, in, in the exercise of trying to estimate the processes and the parameters of the processes. So the simulation gives you sort of the limits and bounds of the process? The simulation would give you the limits, the bounds, the averages, the variances, all the characteristics of the process, uh, which you could then describe from the repeated, the repeated um, uh, maps. I, uh, let me call it that. I don't want to call them samples, but they're not. But the repeat, repeated generations of the process. Okay, so, so far, we're just dealing with points floating in space. Now, we have put the points in reality. And this is network point pattern analysis. Basically, it's the same idea. Everything is the same, except that now we have to think about um, a couple of things. Basically, how do we put the points on the network? How do we anchor them on the network? And how do we compute distances over a network? That is the major complication. So before, we had our circles. That was easy. Point is in the circle. We know that it's within a given distance. On a network, there's no such thing. So for the network, you have to compute the shortest path distance. And the shortest path distance depends on where the point lands on the network. So that's a major complication. On the other hand, it's much more realistic. If you're looking, say, at the locations of accidents, of vehicle collisions, you can look at this in a bounding box as points floating in space, but people don't drive <laughs> through houses. They're stuck on the roads. They're limited by the network. So if you're going to generate randomly replicated point data sets, you don't want to put any collisions inside a house because it doesn't happen there. You have to stick them on the network. And that is the another complication here that the null hypothesis of complete spatial randomness, what is that? It is no longer this homogeneous Poisson process because it's constrained by the network. The points can only land on the network. So then we get a counterpart to this, which, uh, and I have some references in the summary, turns out to be a binomial binomial point process. The idea is uh, mathematically that 
events can happen anywhere equally likely, but anywhere has been redefined. Before, anywhere was literally anywhere. Now, anywhere is any segment on the network. So you can think of this conceptually as, well, how would I do this? How would I put my, say, my 50 accidents randomly in space before we could, we took random, 50 random Xs and 50 random Ys and plopped them in there. Now we can't do that anymore, but we can still, say, pick a random X and Y and then drop that point, say using a GIS function, to the closest segment on the network and say that's where it lands. That's one way of doing it. Other ways of doing it is to actually cut the network into small segments and then randomly pick one of those. And that's where an event lands. And so there's ways to mimic this complete spatial randomness by defining what anywhere means it means specifically in the context of the network, any position on the network. So everything that we've done so far, k functions, cross k functions, we can compute them as long as we can average the number of events within a given distance from an arbitrary event. And so the key there is to be able to compute the distance from an arbitrary event and just count the other events. And as I mentioned, the, the software for this is kind of specialized. Um, it's uh, one of the readings describes it. It's called Senet. It's an um, it it works with ArcGIS, but it's um, not very flexible. So if you're in a crunch, you can get things done, but the extensions it's not been extended. Um, there is a new version, I think, in the works, but right now it's not available. So we won't actually do this in the lab, but I just want you to know how it works because it's very relevant in a lot of contexts. Uh, crime, uh, anything where the movement is chained along a network rather than moving in all directions equally likely, this will be re uh, relevant. And network is perfectly general. You can also think of social networks and so on. So you know, things can get very general in here. We have the same k function, cross k function, simulation envelope. I was just thinking though that in a, in a social network, you're not constrained quite the same way. It's more of a Euclidean distribution. Not necessarily. There are, I mean, you can put structure in social networks too. Say, yeah. if people only communicate through work, then they cannot <laughs> communicate with people that they don't know through their work, for example. But the main, I mean, the most relevant applications are uh, crime, as you will see in a second, locations of stores, traffic accidents, those are the examples. Just to illustrate here, as I said, in the plane there's just circles and counting points in circles. On a network, you actually have to figure out how you move around in a network to find out which points are within a given distance on the network. And on the network then, of course, you can have distance in, in a metric like, a distance metric, miles, meters, kilometers, or travel time, and so on. It's very general. This is an example, I hope you can see it. Um, these, this is for Tokyo, and it's the uh, distribution of noodle restaurants to check whether these are somehow patterned or just random. And obviously, you can only get to them if you get to them from the street. So these noodle restaurants are actually, I mean, actually in Tokyo, it's a little bit more complicated because they're not necessarily on the street. You may have to go through an alley or through some elevator or some other way to get to, get to them. So the first step, you drop them onto the network, like see this one is off the network and it gets dropped on the network because we need to compute nearest neighbor distances on the network. Then we do this and we end up with our k function. This is the observed k function. This is the theoretical k function. This particular graph doesn't have an envelope, but it's the same idea. Uh, since it's above the theoretical function, we would conclude that they are more clustered than they would be randomly. And then the, the other example, which I thought is kind of a, an interesting one, it's 
the noodle restaurants relative to uh, railway stations. So are the noodle restaurants more closer to ra railway stations than they would be randomly, or are they further away from railway stations? And that's an example of the cross K function. Mm -hmm. So we have the pattern for the noodles, the pattern for the stations. We connect the two, and then again, the observed uh, cross K function now using distances along the street network of Tokyo is above the theoretical value which suggests clustering. So um, bottom line is the same thing. As long as you can figure out how the points end up on the network, what are the distances over the network, how do you simulate spatial randomness on the network? No, this is a, a straight drop in, in RGIS or something like that. But it doesn't have to be that way. And in fact, you know, it, there's a lot of work still to be done on point pattern analysis on network. But I think it's a very interesting area because uh, there's so many applications in uh, where you can think of that the points are not just floating in space, but they are constrained by some structure that has a network network streets are obvious. The, the third option I was thinking about is that you're not constrained by networks, but you're constrained by areas, so it's something in between. Yeah. Can you extend the network one to that idea, or? It Actually, it's the other way around. You extend the floating in space one to that, in that you have a mask. Yeah. And when you simulate the points, you simulate them so that they're constrained to fall within the area. But you, ha you would have a lot of masks. For one yes. Area. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Just like, you know, I don't know how much of this I elaborated on in this particular class, but if uh, we, we talked about a bounding box, right? And when we did the, the, the I don't think we worked with convex hulls or anything like that when we did the simulations, um, the lab for the process model. So we had the different, say, Poisson cluster process. We simulated it in a unit square, right? Because that was easy. You just take random coordinates in a unit square. Now, what if you don't have a square? How, how do you simulate this? This is called rejections. One way to do this is rejection, rejection sampling, okay? which the, the, the idea is you create a sample. Does it meet your criterion? You keep it. Does it not? You kick it out and you do it again. So say you would just randomly drawing coordinates, and if they fall inside your mask or your convex hull, you keep it as a real point. If it doesn't, you throw it away and you do it again until you find one that does fit. Um, some of the Mon Markov chain Monte Carlo simulation methods are another way of getting at the same thing, a little more sophisticated. So the idea is always you want to replicate spatial randomness, which means Anything can happen anywhere equally likely. And we have just seen this for regular shapes mostly because it's convenient. But remember earlier today, the concept itself is for very, very small units. So the, the theoretical notion of an intensity, first order moment, second order moment, it's a limit. It's a limit for a very small unit. So this is a concept that can be applied to any kind of surface, be it regular or irregular, it has to be smooth. That's where the limits come in, into play. If it's not smooth, you don't have limits. They're not, you know, they're not well behaved. So it has to be smooth. But the smoothness is not about the points or the areas that the points fall in. It's about the probability that drives the chance that you get a point in a particular area. That has to be smooth. So you can have ravines and whatever you want. That's irrelevant. It's the probability that has to be seen. So then the last step is connecting this back to functions. And um, one reason why the k function is so popular is that it does have a connection to a number of theoretical processes. And we've already seen that for a completely spatial random process, the k function is pi h squared. 
this isn't actually that useful because there are no parameters in there, but say a Poisson cluster process, after a lot of math, you can show that the K function for that process is <coughs> contains the parameter rho, which is the intensity of the parent process. Remember, cluster process is the parents and then the offspring, right? And so if you have a, you need two things to set this up. One is, what is the intensity of the parents? Say, in our, in our simulation exercise, how many parents on average would we have in our square box? And the second one, so in this case, it's a circular process that determines how far away the children are from the parents. And that is driven by a parameter sigma squared, which is the standard deviation of, in this case, a Ga Gaussian or normal process. This is one of the ones we've played with in the lab. So these two things completely determine the characteristics of this particular <coughs> Poisson cluster process. So if we have a point pattern, and we want to find out, is this a Poisson cluster process? And if so, what are its parameters? Now we're in business, or at least somewhat in business, because we can estimate this k function for many, many distances h, and then relate that back to this expression that contains rho and sigma squared. And this is, gives us a way to estimate rho and sigma squared. Because this is observed, this is a number, this is a number, this is unknown, this is a number, and this is unknown. So as long as we have enough of these, we can estimate this by some you know, nonlinear fitting procedure. We can fit the observed values to the parameters rho and sigma squared. So this is, again, I don't have time. This is the most interesting part, but I don't really have time to push it. And also, I realize not everybody has had a lot of statistical background, so this requires a lot of baggage to actually do this. But the idea is very simple. As long as you have more observables than unobservables, you can estimate the unobservables. Okay. And you create the observables by computing this for different distances. And the more of these you have, of course, the more information you will have to get an estimate of the rho and the sigma squared. How you actually do that, we won't get into. There are a number of different methods. I'll just want to give you a general idea, just so you know the terms, if you encounter them in the literature. The, there are two basic um, approaches. One uses generalized linear models, which you, I don't know if you further this, generalized linear models are kind of generalized regression models that you use for, say, count variables. Like Poisson regression is an example of a generalized uh, uh, linear model. Negative binomial is another example. A logit uh, is another example. These are classes of models to deal with non-standard variables. So non-standard meaning not normally distributed and continuous and all that stuff. So, um, in this Badley and Turner article that I have in the references, a framework is laid out that <coughs> approaches the estimation of these processes by what is called the pseudo-likelihood approach. We talked a little bit about likelihood in the context of the scan statistic. It has to do with how likely is it that the data are generated by a partic particular statistical model. Now, these are a little bit different from the standard case because they're relative to the complete spatial random homogeneous Poisson process. And because they're relative, a lot of things cancel out, so it's actually easier to estimate. That's the basic idea. Now, the main contribution of this Badley Turner article is that they showed, and it's, it's hard to read. I'm not you know, making you read it, but if you're interested in this, take a look, because they show how by using the right transformations and right expressions, specifications, you can actually use standard GLM software. Uh, GLM is part of a lot of packages like Stata and others. There's also specialized packages to do it. But you can actually use this standard software to estimate the parameters of a point pattern process, which is, 
a major practical improvement. Then the other class of um, methods ties into these uh, Markov point processes, these uh, processes, these pairwise processes that we talked a little bit about in uh, the second lecture as the most complicated ones. <coughs> these are uh, processes that um, allow pairwise interaction between the points, and they are typically way too complicated to solve analytically but they can be estimated by means of sim what is called simulation estimators, one of which, a, a class of which is called Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, estimation. And let me just, in a minute, uh, try to tell you what this is about or how it works. The idea is, just like before, um, expected values are averages. And so you can, if you simulate things a lot and you take an average, that gives you an estimate for an expected value. Now, what are you going to simulate? You're going to simulate distributions. And you want to get at the parameters of these distributions. So let's say you're, you're interested. Let me give you a very silly example. You're interested in estimating the mean of a normal distribution. And say, we don't even mess with the variance. So we have a data set. And we start by guessing the mean. And then we draw from a normal distribution um, a number of observations. And then we compute the mean for those observations. Then we compare that to the actual mean of, well, we don't, we, some summary of the data, of the <coughs> simulated data, that we compare to some summary of the actual data and build on that a rule to improve our guess of what the mean might be. Then we get a better guess of the mean, we simulate it again, we do the summaries again, we improve our guess again, we keep doing this. That's the idea. So by thinking about a model and the parameters that the model might have, we create fake data. We compare the fake data to the real data, and then the key factor is, is from that we need to learn something about improving our simulation in the next step. Now, mathematically, it gets very complicated, but that's the idea. The, the intuition behind it is you're going to uh, create these fake data and, and, and get them better and better and better, closer and closer and closer to the actual data that you observe. And then, because you are actually simulating the data, you know exactly what the parameters are that you um, that drives your model. Uh, it comes in different flavors. The, the Markov chain has to do with conditional distributions, where you draw one variable conditional upon another variable. Let's say we say that our outcome is a standard normal distribution, uh, is a normal distribution with variance 1. And the mean of that distribution itself is a normal distribution. So then we can do a conditional distribution, conditional upon knowing the mean. But we don't know the mean. What do we do? We draw the mean. We randomly draw the mean. Now we have our condition satisfied. Now we can draw the second one. And as you know, um, any joint distribution can be factored out in a series of conditional distributions. So you can tackle very complex problems this way. That's the idea behind we don't really have time to get into this. Uh, maybe one of these days, if I have extra time, I'll talk a little more about it. But this, this is the main tool used in modern statistics to estimate complex models. Anytime it's discrete, nonlinear, this is the only way to do it. And this has only been feasible since the early mid-90s. And so a lot of problems that before then had no solution or highly artificial solutions with a lot of unrealistic assumptions all of a sudden can be addressed, including point pattern analysis. So this is the end for point pattern analysis.